following report has been created from notes and illustrations compiled during a series of studies conducted by naturalists from the assembly. As is typical of assembly studies, research was done in as non-invasive a way as possible. The peoples of the islands were never contacted. While this gave more natural perspective, seeing an ecosystem without influence from the researchers, it does limit the scope of study in many aspects, and some regions had to be neglected. Future studies with more sophisticated technology, such as drones as in more recent missions, may reveal information that supports or refutes some of the conclusions drawn from available research. This episode is dedicated to Dr. Horace Adams and Agent Jennifer Hartsfield, who gave their lives in the pursuit of studying this island chain thousands of miles from reliable support in the known world. The portal, which populated Chimere with flora and fauna from Earth, has only dominion over a territory around the size of the continental US. This territory has moved with the portal throughout history, and at times being mostly over the mainland, but is currently in an area spanning between eastern Arvel, southern Nikar, Picardia, and thousands of small islands between. When extinctions occur within the territory of the portal, it quickly harvests and repopulates new flora and fauna, which has resulted in a striking bias toward increasingly more recent fauna in the biodiversity of the known world. In the realms beyond, the portal has neither jurisdiction nor interest. Because of this, the ecological cast of characters beyond the known world is far more independent having a natural ebb and flow of success and extinction, and hundreds of clades without recent Earth ancestors have evolved into a wide range of dynasties throughout the planet's history, many of which are barely recognizable to modern viewers, although some seem trapped in time. It was not long after the survey of the Permian Islands that assembly researchers came upon another archipelago further west, following charts given to them by the Great Library. These islands were closing in on the eastern coast of Kairu. Although the islands were all connected as part of a mostly submerged continental plate, and the space between these quite shallow, the ocean surrounding this region is very deep, so the islands are still terrestrially isolated, despite being only 500 miles from shore. Although it was first assumed the islands had broken off of Kairul in the distant past, survey of its living fauna, fossil history, and tectonic motion has resulted in the leading theory being actually that it came from the southeast, back toward the known world, and moved up on a collision course with Kairul. This island chain was once a larger continent and part of the portal's territory around 150 million years ago. Most of the terrestrial fauna was wiped out in a mass extinction which ended the first Jurassic dynasty, and the continent had drifted north by the time the Cretaceous harvests began, so its terrestrial fauna today primarily descend from only a few harvests in Earth's late Jurassic period. It is because of this that the region was given its name, the Jurassic Islands, although some prefer them to be used by the name given by the Great Library. Lidigruk, which roughly translates to Mountain of the Sleeping God. There are many islands in the highland remains of this once vast continent, but three are generally regarded as noteworthy. The largest island, Antiqua Major, is the largest to the southwest. Antiqua Minor and its surrounding smaller islands, and finally Mount Solomontis, the great spire of granite which, with its highest peak estimated to be nearly 8 miles above sea level, is thought to be among the tallest places in Chimere. At least the tallest place ever recorded by Chimeran or assembly agents. According to the records of the Great Library, this mountain is where an elder god sleeps. To the west, the island of Antiqua Minor is a mix of badlands, deserts, and a prairie of sedges and harsh grass. It is here that the team encountered their first Jurassic dinosaurs. 
Unlike in the known world, where almost all dinosaurs trace their lineage to the late Cretaceous, all the dinosaurs here are from the Jurassic. The most common animals are herds of small cursorial new ornithischians, who would not stand out much in a lineup of such taxa as Nanosaurus and Dryosaurus. Their calls are very complex, and the lilting songs echo across the Badlands. Their flocking behavior is sophisticated thanks to keen vision, impressive reflexes, and sensitive pads on their feet allowing them to sense the movements of those beyond their already impressive field of vision. Several distinct species were identified, with the most abundant being assigned to the genus Hartsfieldia, and the biggest being a one-ton jogger told Neocamptosaurus. As the only large game worth hunting is only found in open territory, where ambushes are difficult to set up, it should come as no surprise that the top predator of Antiqua Minor is also a swift, highly alert theropod. The exact cladistics are unknown, but it is believed that Pardosuchus is of a family descended from Noasaurs, with a possibly omnivorous Elaphrosaurus proposed to be an ancestor. This is supported by another small herbivore, Gazella Sucus, in many ways resembling this great sprinter. Further observation showed that both are omnivorous, with Gazella Sucus supplementing their sedge diet with the occasional little rhynchocephalian or multituberculate, while Pardo Sucus will indulge in nuts and berries when the season provides. For the most part, however, Pardo Sucus is a dedicated carnivore. They aren't as maneuverable, swift, in short bursts as their ornithischian prey, but extremely long legs and great height affords them impressive speed, endurance, and the ability to keep an eye on their prey. Oftentimes, they won't even bother trying to hide or outrun in the short term. Once they choose a target, they will follow and run it to the ground. By the time they catch up, their prey will be on the ground wheezing, and they will have an easy go of dispatching it with a powerful bite and letting peg-like teeth puncture organs. Gazellosuchus only have teeth as juveniles, while Pardosuchus retain them as adults. Although Pardosuchus is much larger, the leading theory is that it is a neotenic giant, stepping up to the role of apex predator when whatever was before them died out. To the east, across a scattering of tiny islands throughout a shallow sea, is the vast island of Antiqua Major. With the rain shadow of the mountains along its northern point coupled with the dead winds and the horse latitudes, much of northern Antiqua Major is similar scrubland to Antiqua Minor. While the badlands of the small island are supported by a few spring-fed and minimal mountain peak meltwater rivers, Antigua Major has higher mountains with more significant runoff. Overall, though, the conditions are similar. Many of the animals found in Antigua Minor are also found on these grasslands, and it has been proposed that this is where most of them evolved. The island hopped across the sea within a fairly recent time frame, perhaps only the past few million years. Far from a lost world, this level of dynamic interchange suggests far more competitive ecosystems than one often finds on even larger islands. On Antiqua Major, however, Pardosuchus is not the top predator. In the scrublands of Antiqua Major, thanks to more glacial runoff supporting more floral cover and less even terrain, a burly ambush predator has taken this title. Carnosuchus vulgaris is a large theropod. They are abundant throughout Antiqua Major, numerically dominating the jungles, open forests, floodplains, wetlands, and even the scrublands. In the words of Dr. Aldous Hartsfield, they are a very generic theropod, with large serrated teeth like Ceratosaurus, a low-slung body like Torvosaurus, and wedge-shaped head of Allosaurus, although they lack the lion of the Jurassic's distinctive head crest. Variously argued to be a megalosaur, allosauroid, and even primitive tyrannosaur, it is now believed that they are actually a highly derived ceratosaur, perhaps even noasaurs like Pardosuchus. 
although they are obviously from a clade which has evolved in a very different direction in modern times. Others place them in the same ceratosaur lineage as ceratosaurs itself, despite it having three fingers on each hand and the formidable meat hook claws of tetanurans. Considering the inhabitants of this island have been in Chimere for more than twice as long as many other late Cretaceous dinosaurs of the known world, many of the assembly are less concerned with narrowing down the possible ancestor 150 or more million years ago and classifying them into modern clades. Carnosuchus does have two smaller species in the island, namely in the two dense jungles on either side of the southern peninsula, suggesting they only recently got large. This is consistent with the assumption that the dynastic extinction impacted the Jurassic Islands rather substantially. There have been fossils found in the foothills of Antiqua Minor's mountain range, which suggests some more recent familiar taxa like Stegosaurs and Allosaurs once called this island home, but in the many mass extinctions Chimera has endured since their introduction to the late Jurassic have taken their toll. The most abundant large herbivores of the island, and indeed the preferred prey of Carnosuchus vulgaris, are the sauropods. Most common of these is the whip-tailed Flagella Draco, with a small and gracile closed forest species and a robust species found in open forests and prairies. They were initially presumed to be descended from Diplodocus or Apatosaurus, but some have argued for their place within Dicreosauridae due to the shape of their vertebrae and teeth. Others consider them to be basal to Neosauropoda, given some cranial elements, especially since all large sauropods have divergent body plans, but close inspection shows them all to be within the same family or superfamily, Flagellosauridae. Regardless of placement, these elephant-sized sauropods live in small groups and keep contact through a vast auditory network, leading some to suggest the herds are debatably much larger than they initially appear. They are specialist browsers of low-growing vegetation. The ends of their tails are comprised of keratin, not bone. The bulky muscles of the tail base can be employed to make the tail snap like a whip. As it is comprised mostly of dead skin, regular cracking leaves the tip frayed and can diminish its efficacy until the distal layers shed but it doesn't damage the living tissue further up the tail. Although there are a few instances of them using these tails to deter predators, either by auditory snaps or physical contact, this can lead to debilitating injuries, and most used to feel nearby members of the herd and to communicate by letting out a distant crack which can be heard up to 15 miles away. And the assembly have identified seven different types of crack patterns. It's hardly enough to constitute a language, but the herd does seem to respond differently to each word, and the assembly has marked this as a subject to investigate further with future missions. Another common sauropod is a close cousin of Flagella Draco called Mandosaurus. They are more comfortable in wetter environments, though not exclusively, and tend to be quite adaptable in diet feeding on a wide range of low and middle browsing. This flexibility in habitat and diet means they can go almost anywhere on the island. They will sometimes join the more abundant Flagella Draco and mixed species herds, though tend to prefer their own company in wetter habitats, which tend to have more abundant and reliable food and less competition. The largest animal found on all the islands is the Great Archipiscopotitan. These are the gardeners of the Jurassic Island. They prefer to feed on treetops, which often means shoving down trees that are too tall to reach, or if they simply don't feel like reaching. They are messy browsers, claw tilling and root cracking steps, Nutrient-rich dung heaps and lumber felling keeps the forests of Antiqua Major verdant even without regular rains. 
Archipiscopa Titan isn't especially common, but like other sauropods, they keep in touch with far-reaching calls. Between these three abundant species, Antichra Major is consistently rumbling with calls. Many of which humans can't hear because of the low frequencies, although by all accounts it could be nauseating to be exposed to for too long, something also reported by Picardian and Arveleth who live amongst Titans. Archipiscopa Titan stands an impressive 30 feet tall. Not particularly impressive compared to the Titans of the known world, but for this island habitat, they are unchallenged in terms of size and height. Although they look quite different from other sauropods, it is believed that they are still fairly close relatives, sharing a small common ancestor that lived in the jungles during the Tyrant Dynasty, while Macronarians and Stegosaurs ruled, and emerged to drive the last vestiges of these last two clades to conclusion with the dynastic extinction. Now these three have diversified into strikingly different species in a classic example of adaptive radiation. All sauropods need dry soil to nest. Mandosaurus and Flagella Draco both congregate to the southwest, where warm climates combined with cool offshore winds make for a perfect hot, dry climate. It is here that males of both species do battle to impress female herds. When giants of this size do battle, it is often to the death. Surviving bulls leave as soon as mating is done, while cows depart once their eggs are laid. The bulls who perished serve as a lure for scavengers from all around. Carnosuchus in particular is drawn to the feast. With their sacrifice, the bulls who lay down their lives inadvertently provide a scent distraction for the eggs while the nests are fresh. By the time the body is consumed, the scent of eggs will be masked by weather and decay, and most predators and scavengers depart. When the eggs hatch six months later, it is just as the rainy season begins, and there is a boom of food and undergrowth which will guide them to closed forests, where they will grow over the next years into giants. A similar story unfolds with Archipiscopa Titan to the north. Although this terrain is dry, it is not especially warm, so cows must dig deeper trenches. They go compete for space, especially given their size, which is a plus, but they don't have a convenient ascent distraction in laying down as many lives. With this taken into account, cows will often lay as many as twice as the number of eggs as the smaller sauropod species. Playing a numbers game in this way, they increase the odds of their young surviving. As their young hatch in the beginning of the wet season too, there's a reasonable assumption they can find cover, but it's still typical for only a few of these 40 to 50 eggs per clutch even reaching adolescence, much less adulthood. Archipiscopa Titan is far less abundant than their two smaller cousins, and their reproductive strategy is assumed to play a role in this. They aren't as violent, but without a scent distraction, they must count on local mammals, birds, and reptiles filling up on the abundance of sauropodlets, which is quite a gamble if every year the critters know that there is a bounty to be had in the young of the year. Neocamptosaurus is also present in this area, with some larger and slower species rounding out the large faunal cast in the forests. They and other stem ornithopods are quite aggressive toward would-be nest raiders in the off-season, which benefits all dinosaurs on the island. Neocamptosaurus prefers to nest in the same site as Archipiscopa Titan, and they like the same soil and plants that grow from sauropod dung is highly nutritious for their own young, and their presence also benefits the sauropods in actively hunting nest raiders. While generalists, Neocamptosaurus seem to prefer cycads, which are common throughout northern Antiqua Major. This preference has been suggested as a reason why the last of the stegosaurs may have been outcompeted, although perhaps Neocamptosaurus simply took over a vacant yet highly nutritious niche when the plated lizards went extinct. At least one species of Nodosaur has been documented in the open habitats, and two in the forest. 
None are particularly large, but they are well defended. Unlike the sauropods and theropods, which have their own ways derived and are hard to pin to a clade, these are so similar to Gargoyleosaurus that they are listed as a living fossil, or a Lazarus taxon. Heterodontosaurs are reluctantly believed to be the ancestor of the Simiosaurids, quilled monkey-like dinosaurs that evolved into a wide range of arboreal species convergently similar to arboreal pachycephalosaurs in Kairul. Not much is known about these, or indeed many of the residents of the dense jungles on the eastern coast, as the assembly did not investigate these closed jungles. There are few mammal species present on the island. Some, like multituberculates and eutraconodonts, are scattered throughout the islands, although the largest is only about the size of a cat. Bats are very recent migrants, though competition with neuronathids and enantiornithian birds mean that they've yet to establish themselves in any significant population. An Aborfeltharian, or Permian jackal, has been spotted in the prairies of the north of Antiqua Major. They aren't a fast or powerful enough species to bring down even Hartsfieldia, although they have killed many species of hatchling dinosaur, and mammals are particularly vulnerable to their venom. The islands are peopled. The closed forests are home to a rare yet ubiquitous group of humans. They are not contacted and, in accordance to assembly protocol, once their existence was discovered, the closed forest region they called home was avoided. It is assumed that, like the Arvelith and Picardiant, these people who live alongside dinosaurs stick to areas where the largest threats aren't as common, but this is simply conjecture until contact with locals to discuss their history is authorized. There are also villages to the north along the many islands and coastal regions, including the foothills of Mount Solomontis. These peoples were, of course, also not contacted, although distant observation showed numerous similarities to the peoples of the Permian Islands in terms of settlement construction. A recent settlement in the area would explain the presence of Permian jackals around 3,000 miles from home. Much like the peoples of the coastal forests, it is not known how these people ha have been present. There are no dragons, so it is presumed that the migration and settlement took place after the collapse of the Dragon Rider civilization, with some even wondering if these may be refugees of that crisis. But again, total conjecture. Although they do live on the coastal foothills of the Great Mountain, the villagers all appear to be fishermen. They do not venture up into the mountain. According to the records of the Great Library, it is home to one of the many elder gods indigenous to the planet, so it is little surprise that none dare venture within. However, there are temples carved into the sides of the mountain far above the villages, with writing seems to be similar to witch holds back in the known world during the Age of Witches. Witches often drew power from trapped homunculi, and some even dared to tap into the magic of elder gods like the Great Portal and Ushalek forests. In every recorded instance, this ended in disaster, and it is assumed the same would befell of any who tried to bargain with whatever god resides in the heart of this lonely mountain. Even so, the Assembly is hopeful that future expeditions might illuminate more information about the nature of this sleeping god. Thank you so much to David for sponsoring this episode. I know it wasn't a usual episode date, but in honor of Jurassic Park's 30th anniversary, he thought it would be fun to celebrate with an exploration of a Jurassic Island in my own project. A fine idea if you ask me. Jurassic Park is one of my favorite movies and favorite books, so having this tribute of sorts was a lot of fun. If you would like to learn about the Mountain of the Sleeping God, keep an eye out for my next anthology, Whispers from Beyond the Known World. Tentatively set for a September release, but we'll see how fast I can get these stories done with everything else going on. Much thanks to my Patreon patrons for your support. As many of you know, I don't have perks, it's just a way to keep the project and allow me to do what I do, and for y'all's support, I am deeply appreciative. 
If you want to join as little as a dollar a month, it's right there in the description. I also have a YouTube membership program which basically does the same thing. Cheers again to David and thank you for watching. Every watch and ad goes a long way and I deeply appreciate y'all watching and engaging. Warms my heart, it keeps me chugging along. Stay fantastic everyone. Cheers folks.